Okay, I was just leaving work and it was raining, really cold, I mean 40 degrees and when I approached my car, I opened the back door, I put my purse, the big purse, the bag, the working bag in the front of the back seat and the guy approached me with a gun and he wanted the money and I said, I'll give you the money, here are the money, so I gave him the money that they wanted the purse, they grabbed the purse and they were going through stuff in the purse and when they found the key from the car, I mean, the guy said, I have the key. And the guy in the, on the side of the car, he shot me. That's, I mean, it showed words. How much money was it? Five dollars, that's what they found in the purse. Mm -hmm. What else was in the purse? It was my cards and my all belongings and I didn't want to give them the purse because my green card was in there, my passport was in there, so I said I cannot give you my purse because my cards are in there, so I was trying to hold to my purse, but of course they grabbed it and they hit me and hit me, so they got the purse and the second guy, he ran away on the side of the, I mean, back of the car and just tried to find whatever he can in the purse, I guess looking for the money, so but there wasn't any more money, so then they the guy with the gun, he asked me where are my keys and I said I don't know where are my keys because when I was giving them the money I dropped them somewhere and it was in the car or on the ground or somewhere so I said I don't know where are my keys. He said you don't know and I said no I don't know. So I guess he was getting mad or something but the guy who was having my purse and going through the stuff in the purse, he said I found the key. So he was approaching this guy and then that the guy with the gun, he shot me. So you immediately recognized that it was a gun that he had? Yes, I mean, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. okay. And was he trying to find out what particular your car you had? Was he trying to get you to give that information to him? No, no. Okay. It was nothing about the car. I didn't know they would be interested in the car. I mean, until they started asking about the keys, I guess they were trying to leave in the car, so. Do you think it would have made a difference if you had more than five dollars? I don't think so, no. No, they, they didn't want just the money. They, if they wanted just the money, they would get the money and leave, but they didn't leave. So, and they shot me. I was no threat to them whatsoever. I was lying on the ground crying, you know, and hurt and everything, and he shot me there. I was totally, you know, no danger to them whatsoever and he shot me so I don't think it would make any difference if I had thousand dollars in that purse. Okay, and when you say they, how many people were there? Three, three guys. Mm -hmm. okay. Could you at that moment believe that that was happening? I, I know everything was probably so fast. No, it was really fast and it's just, no I didn't realize actually that it was that dangerous because uh, I wasn't afraid about my life, that time I was afraid I'm going to lose the green card for which I was, you know, working so hard so many years and spent so much money and it was really so much hassle that if I started thinking about it that I'm going to lose it and I have to go through the same stuff over and over again, that was more threatening to me than the situation because I didn't think that they would shot me or kill me or really hurt me that bad. It didn't cross my mind at that point. So. And then how soon was it that Lamar came in to your rescue? Uh, then I, after they shot me, I was laying on the ground and for I guess a few minutes I was unconscious, I would say, but I knew that my brain was still working and I was trying to get up and I got up, I was trying to walk, but I couldn't walk, so I fell down again, and that's when he found me, so. Okay, and you were assured that he was trying to help you, that it wasn't, you know, He asked me, he, he screamed if I need help, and I said yes, so then when he approached me, he grabbed me and, and helped me to kind of walk under the roof, so get me out of the rain. Thank you.
On the night of February the 1st, around 6.30, I was uh, in my work study building and I heard a loud gunshot go off. So I immediately went, went to see what was going on. And as I peeked around that corner, I saw that Dr. Scott was staggering in the middle of the parking lot going on around the circles. So I immediately ran after her, and as I approached her, I saw she had blood all in her hair, all in her clothes. So she fell to the ground. I immediately picked her up uh, off the ground because it was raining that night. So I just wanted to get her out of the rain and just laid her on the uh, by that pillar, just get out of the rain. And at that time, you know, she was uh, telling me that uh, she needed to go to the hospital to call her husband. So uh, I was just uh, amazed that she was able to, you know, tell me, uh, give me her, her husband's number and name in the condition that she was in. So I called her husband, uh, alerted her, uh, her husband what was going on, and after I called him. Blood just everywhere, was it a massive amount? It really was, and it was, uh, she actually had uh, a pole of blood where she had actually gotten shot, and then once I laid her down, you could just see the blood coming out, and so I didn't actually know where she had gotten shot, because it was blood in her hair and on her clothes, so I just, I didn't want to, you know, cause further damage, so I really didn't touch it that much. Well, she called me at 629 and told me she was leaving the J.A. Peoples building to go to her car. And uh, Lamarck Humphrey called me at 642 and told me that uh, he was sorry to tell me that she had been shot. So I figured from 631 to maybe, you know, 637, somewhere in that period of time, six minutes or so, that uh, the event occurred, so it was uh, rather fast. And uh, Lamarck was, uh, when, his, when he called me, he was very uh, short with his remarks. He didn't elaborate. He said, told me right off that uh, she had been shot. I asked him how she was. And he said, she's conscious, but there's a lot of blood. And uh, then he told me he'd call me back as soon as the ambulance got there and they decided where to take her. Did he call from his phone? Did he call from Dr. Scott's phone? He called from his own cell phone. Her cell phone was broken uh, and uh, laying out in the driveway, I assume, because uh, that we, we got the sack back from the police department that had her personal effects in it, or some of her personal effects. The phone battery was out and the back of the phone was off, so I'm assuming that it hit the pavement and, and was probably there when the police picked it up later. Did it go? Did it ever go in your mind that this was some kind of hoax or something, or did he just really sound credible? Well, at we the get time? we get quite a few, uh, you know, wrong number calls on our number. And uh, at first, uh, I thought he had a wrong number. Uh, I heard people talking in the background. Uh, I found out later that it was probably the JSU Police Department that was there. And uh, it didn't seem real. I thought, you know, that maybe uh, it was somebody playing a joke. Uh, and uh, it didn't make any sense to me that she was leaving work and then she was shot in the matter of just a few minutes. You know, just it's uh, it's very difficult to put that together because she's been working there for eight years, and uh, there's been incidents there that that uh, we knew about, but nobody had ever been shot before. Um, you know, so it just didn't make any sense. You know, why would anybody shoot her? She, uh, she's not a threat to anyone. So it just, uh, it was really eerie. And of course, uh, I left immediately. And on the way uh, from here to Jackson, before I even knew where they were taking her, I got a call, I'm assuming from an ambulance driver that had her en route to the University Medical Center, and they told me that's where they were taking her. Uh, so I had an hour's drive of not even knowing whether she was dead or alive. Uh, it's really a strange feeling, you know, because uh, you can't really concentrate on driving when so many thoughts are going through your head. Is Lamarck, is he a hero? Oh, absolutely. 
But Mark is one of those uh, Mark is one of those rare individuals that we see just so seldom. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, he was crazy to go out there the way he did. But I don't think Lamarck really understands uh, what he did. Uh, he doesn't think like most people do. You know, that, oh, well, that's the noise. I'm not going to go out there and get in it. Everyone I've talked to, with no exceptions, has told me, as I would, that if I had been sitting in my dorm room at the university and heard shots out in the parking lot, uh, I would have just maybe called the police uh, in that neighborhood. I understand that hearing shots is not that uncommon. Uh, I might have just ignored it. And I think most people would either have ignored it or they would close their blinds and turn off their lights and hope that they weren't going to get shot. But the mark thought somebody needed help. It could have been a drug deal gone bad. Uh, when he got out there and he saw my wife stumbling around the parking lot, uh, it might have occurred to him that maybe it was a jealous boyfriend that had shot her, or maybe she was involved in a drug deal. But he just didn't think. He just went directly to her. And uh, it's, it's rare. And I think probably, I was in the service, I was in the Air Force and uh, he's going to be in the Air Force when he gets out of university. But I think that he's one of those kind of individuals that just thinks about uh, what's right and goes out and does it. And uh, I guess can be dangerous at some times, but uh, thank God for Lamar, because without him going to her, nobody else did. And other people heard the shots, I've heard, but he was the only one that went out there. And to add even more mystery to it, he wasn't supposed to be there that night. He was supposed to go home that night at his house and uh, because he had an orthodontist department the next morning. So what made Lamarck stay there? You know, uh, What made him go out there? I mean, it was just, it was really unreal. It was really a strange, strange story. I think if anybody ever sat down and really analyzed it, with all the things that occurred that saved her life, you know, his actions were a very important element of her being alive today. There were other things, you know, starting with the small caliber bullet, which we don't know yet whether it was a 22 or 25 uh, or what, but that was one thing. The next thing was the fact that the bullets missed her brain. Uh, they either had to be incredibly bad shots or some unseen hand was guiding the bullets away from her brain. And then Lamarck. Those three things right there are the three miracles that saved her, and they all happened at the same time, which I think is extremely unusual. Plus then you have the, the, the ambulance drivers that kept her alive, and the, the people in the hospital that, that acted quickly and did the right things at the right time, stopped the bleeding, uh, stabilized her. I mean, you know, it's, if you really think about it, it's one of those things that we will never know uh, how it all came together. Well, we've contacted uh, uh, Congressman uh, Thompson, Benny Thompson, through a friend of mine, a very close friend, uh, former Congressman Ronnie Shiles, who was, I believe, in the 4th District here. Uh, I think Chip Pickering took his seat. But he spoke to Benny for us on our behalf. And I understand that on February the 23rd, there was uh, uh, several paragraphs read into the congressional record to honor Mark Humphreys for his heroic actions, I believe they said above and beyond the call of duty, which is, which is the same thing they say about the Medal of Honor. And uh, we're very happy that that happened. Uh, he also mentioned to the speaker that uh, when he, in his address that we had, we had requested that he be uh, recommended for the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which as you know is the highest honor that can be given to an American citizen, not in the military. I don't know where they're going to go with that. It seems to me like that medal is reserved for people that are high profile, such as Desmond Tutu and uh, Ted Kennedy, people that have, are 
were very popular and very well known. But if doing what he did is not being a hero, then I don't know what is. I mean, he risked his life to save hers, not knowing whether she was white or black, whether she was Christian or Muslim, whether she was a Democrat or a Republican. He didn't think about that. He's an American. And he went out there and he saved another life of another human being at the cost of his risk of his own life. So, uh, you know, Lamar needs to be uh, recognized for what he's done. But moreover, he needs to, we need to keep track of Lamar. I'm very interested to see when he does become an officer in the United States Air Force, how quickly he rises to a higher, higher commission. Because uh, I've, I've got a feeling that he'll make it all the way up to general with his attitude. And if you've met Lamar, you know that he's soft-spoken, he's very likable, he's a good-looking kid. He's just the, he's, he's the example of what I would think the American male would be. Absolutely. Uh, we don't know whether all these men are in custody. Uh, you know, it could be that uh, she's in danger. And, uh, you know, I have a permit to carry a concealed weapon, and I will wear it wherever I am, as long as it doesn't violate the laws of the state of Mississippi. Uh, and we'll just try to refrain from going in those places where it does. Uh, and, uh, you know, I will use that weapon if I have to, to protect her life as anyone else would do if they had that right and that ability. Just right there, please. One. Yeah, and it's as I said, it, it, that close from my spine, you know, and it's it's amazing that he's just stopped there and, you know, nothing else was hurt or, you know, damaged or anything. And I'm here, as I said, I'm talking, I'm walking, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking straight. I mean, none part of my brain was damaged or hurt or anything. It, it's amazing and I don't know why. And I just will be praying for the rest of my life that it happened as it happened and thank to everybody and all the help that I got at the University of Medical Center. They were great. They were absolutely marvelous they, for all the job they did and they, they helped me to, to get through the bad times and I'm thankful to everybody for everything. So, and I don't know how I can say it every day, 100 times, it still won't be enough, so. We don't know whether all these men are in custody. Uh, you know, it could be that uh, she's in danger. And, uh, you know, I have a permit to carry a concealed weapon and I will wear it wherever I am, as long as it doesn't violate the laws of the state of Mississippi. Uh, and we'll just try to refrain from going in those places where it does. Uh, and, uh, you know, I will use that weapon if I have to, to protect her life, and as anyone else would do if they had that well, right. There's a lot of things that are on our mind. We've talked about it and discussed it. Uh, yeah, I have one very important thing. I am determined that something good needs to come out of this bad incident and I hope that a good thing will be a fund that I would like to start which will be for better security of the Jackson State University, the whole campus. So I would like to ask all the staff, faculty and all the students to support this fund because it doesn't have to be just to buy new lights, to install new lights or the safety cameras on the parking lots or in the buildings, but it can be, for example, for the classes where the students will be uh, teached about how uh, they should react in uh, the situations of violent crimes, how they should uh, 
react in similar type of situation when somebody approach them with a gun or a knife or somebody who try to rob them or assault them or hurt them so it can be for many other kind of purposes that will help the safety of the students the faculty and staff of the Jackson State University yeah because these these children and their children even though some of them are nearly 20 years old uh, they go to the university to study and to learn and to better their lives but they don't go there to be uh, soldiers they don't need to be fighting for their lives they need to be studying but they do have to have some basic skills in order to survive. They need to walk in groups, they need to stay out of unlit areas, uh, they need to try to refrain from walking around the campus at nighttime. And most important of all, they need to know how to react, as she said, if they are approached by someone, uh, what to do and what not to do, because you make one, one small mistake in your history. Because these people, they don't understand what really they doing. They don't understand how much it hurts, not just outside, but also inside. Because it's just so many people out there that are trying to do their job good and be good citizens and just good proper life, you know. And then somebody else, as these individuals, are trying to rob you or take off, you don't know, your life or just maybe wouldn't have to be me, could be anybody, could be the students, could be, I don't know, your daughter, or could be your son, or could be somebody else's wife or husband. They will hurt them, they will kill them, or they will assault them, or whatever, and they don't care. They don't have any feelings for a human life whatsoever, and that's very scary. That's what makes me mad that these kind of people are out there and we are not able to do anything, you know, to protect ourselves against such individuals in that kind of situation. The most difficult times was, I guess, the first couple of days in the hospital. But I got so many letters and so many flowers and gifts and presents from people that I don't even know that I have never met in my life that were wishing me a speedy recovery, they were praying for me, they were thinking about me, they care about me and they hoping that I get well soon, that give me so much strength that I didn't even know that I have inside of myself just to, to prove that I can do it, that I can get through these bad times because Thank God he had uh, different plans for me than just to be dead or just, you know, to be as a vegetable for the rest of my life. But thank to all these people, to all my family, to all my friends and to even people that, that just are trying to be my friends and care about me in the bad situation. It gave me enough strength to go through those bad times and just survive and be here as I am now. I was, yes, extremely. But like I said, you know, uh, once my adrenaline, you know, you know, reacted, I just, you know, didn't have time to think, I just reacted. I've got the award after award after award, and I've got congratulations on this, congratulations on that, but you know, to me, in a situation like that, it's not really a congratulations, it's more of a thank God you were there. I don't really because like I said, all I did was actually make a phone call, you know, people you know saying that you, you've done much more than that, you know, but I, to me, I don't consider myself a hero. You know, I, I've met them, well, I've, I've met them only once, but I've talked to them several times. And, you know, after a situation like this, it's like, you know, we, we, we're, we're going to be close forever.
So what was the meeting that occurred on Thursday? What was that like to, to see her after the shooting incident that happened on Monday? I was actually just relieved to see that, you know, she was actually out of the bed. She was talking, you know, she was talking, I mean, walking, hugging. I was like, you know, after being shot in the head twice and able to talk and walk is just amazing. So, you know, I, I got a big, great hug from uh, Mr. Scott, you know, one of those family type hugs. So it was, it was astonishing. Is this something that you would do all over again? Oh, yes. If I had to, I'm sure I would do it all over again. And I'm sure anybody else in the situation would do it. I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. I uh, went to Forest Hill High School, graduated. Uh, I'm a computer engineering major. I played in the uh, Sunny Boom of the South my freshman year, but got a little too much with uh, involved in ROTC as well. So I'm just all around type of guy. I plan on going to commission me as an officer in the United States Air Force, uh, even becoming a cargo pilot or uh, working community. Uh, maybe actually uh, the lights, uh, security guards have been back here patrolling more often, and I see security more often, so I actually feel safe. Yeah, Mr. Scott, I would like to thank him for uh, publicly uh, allowing all this to happen. You know, because you know, if it, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't have done not one interview at all. Um, and to Dr. Scott, uh, recently she just had a surgery. I hope her she gets a speedy recovery. It's, it's very humbling, but you know, for you know, in any situation like that, you know, every, like I said, everyone is someone's loved one. And I, like I said, I can't imagine you know my mother or my father getting shot somewhere and somebody's able to help them and they just step it up like it's, it's nothing.